uh, and there was this one girl who had it, so she got to work on that guy. The talent not only made money from stripping, dancing, and getting cash thrown at them, they also made money by flirting by the bar or on couches or wherever, and they also made money by, they also made money going into separate rooms where they spent one-on-one -on -one time with the men, the men had to pay rent for those. And they also made money hooking. Rooms, in addition to paying for the strippers, in addition to whatever they paid on top of that. These men spent so much money, these men spent an insane amount of money, and I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe how much men will empty out their pockets for what seems to be nothing. Maybe they, they got contact information and they kept in touch with some of the men and went and uh, prostituted themselves, that's possible. Became bad sugar daddies, that's possible. But in the club itself, these guys spilled so much money. And it was fascinating. I remember one night, uh, this, this Russian girl complaining that she had the worst night ever. And I was like, why, like you didn't make any money? She's like, no, I only made $5,000. And I was like, what? She only made $5,000. Yeah, so this is Pade Sela. She grew up a uh, traditional Orthodox Jew. She looks Persian, and uh, she was trying to develop a career in the conservative news media. So she thought she'd polish her skills by working at a strip club. Thousand dollars that night, just a night, not even like their day job. She only made five thousand dollars that night, and she's complaining. She's like sad. I was just impressed. Not all the girls were stupid and lazy and on drugs, like how the public talks about. They were really impressive. There were so many business. Okay, let's uh, welcome uh, Duvid into the show. Duvid, how did Weekend Review go yesterday? Okay, hang on a second. That's probably on, that may be on my end. So let me just check the settings here. Okay, yeah, it's on my end. And okay, try it again, Duvid. You hear me? Yep, hear you just fine. How did, uh, how did Weekend Review go yesterday? Thank God, very good. Okay, well, any highlights? Um, not really. I mean, uh, I, I had a tough day yesterday, so uh, um, I mean, we had Vince and we had uh, another guest, but uh, you're just kind of updates talking, although it still went for like four hours. Okay, great. So I've got various things to bounce off you today, but I'll start off with a common interchange between parents and children. So often parents will say to kids, hey, why did you do X? And the kid will say, well, everyone was doing it. And the parents say, well, if everyone was jumping off a bridge, would you do it too? Now, I would side with the kids 99% of the time, providing the people that they're around are decent people, because most of the time, if everybody is doing it, that is a pretty good guide to it being relatively safe. So what do you, what's your reaction to everybody's doing it as, as a guide to life, if you're talking about your, your peer group in particular? Well, I think there's actually a logical fallacy that's uh, directly named off of that. But uh, you know, besides for the logical fallacy, um, yeah, I mean, it's pretty normal to, uh, you have to have some sort of heuristic of how to do things. And uh, you're relatively that other people are doing, it's probably a pretty good one. And what's the logical fallacy that you're thinking about? I forget the exact name, but you know, like the the you just uh, doing something because everyone else is doing it. Okay, so I was just reading this book about David Friedrich Strauss. He wrote a controversial, the most controversial book written in German in the 19th century. He wrote a history of Jesus, a critical examination, where he essentially went through the Gospels and and showed that uh, the reports of miracles were, were bogus and that the, the Gospels were not historically reliable. So I'll just read a few excerpts from this 2020 book by a professor in his 70s, Frederick Beiser. He specializes in 19th century German uh, philosophy. And so his book, the most controversial German publication in the entire 19th century, no other book aroused such a strong and sustained reaction one contemporary described its effect as a bombshell. Another likened it to an electric shock. Still another wrote about the panic-stricken terror among the general public. Protestants were shocked by the book because in questioning the historical credibility of the New Testament, Strauss's work seemed to attack the very basis of their faith. If the faith rested upon the Bible and the Bible were not credible, what basis could there be for faith? Now, Judaism generally speaking, the way it functions is not primarily based on faith. Most Orthodox Jews were raised that way. It's based on belonging to a tribe and to a traditional way of life. How important in your mind is faith 
for leading a traditional Jewish life? Um, for me, it's the center of it because uh, I'm not really necessarily part of any, I don't really feel too affiliated. Uh, you know, I'm only a half Jew and uh, I'm somewhat an outsider of the community. So the tribal aspect, uh, I don't really have like Jews calling me or like cousins or, or anything like that. So it's almost purely um, faith in the structure of the religion. Although you like, I mean, the classically both elements are true. Judaism is a tribe and a religion and it could have various elements you know to different because there's millions of jews and there's hundreds of different sects and ways of approaching judaism so that could have uh your relevance anyway um you're divisible that you know it could be the people you're hanging out with it's mostly tribal uh you know there might be some mystics or you know brooklyn even in la or detroit you know some people that really take god and spirituality seriously although that's probably a minority so for me from like the judaism is true as my approach to life because god created as a true system is probably in the minority and even more to be found in like you know converts and uh bali chuva all right let me read a little bit more here from frederick Beiser. the hostile reaction to strauss's book imposed a harsh fate upon him trained in the uh, famous uh, protestant tubinger seminary to become a cleric or a theologian he found himself banished from these professions. It was impossible for him to find employment as a preacher or a professor. He was forced to work as an independent author and to live off the meager royalties of his writings. Having acquired the reputation of an antichrist, Strauss was shunned by colleagues and friends who feared for their reputations and careers if they were known to associate with him. He soon became a lonely, bitter man. He never joined a profession. He never formed a lasting marriage. He never enjoyed domestic happiness. All his days, he led the life of a sad recluse. 25 years after the publication of his famous book, he summarized the effects of his book on his life and career. It excluded me from public teaching, for which I had desire and perhaps even talent. It tore me out of natural relationships and drove me into unnatural ones, and it made the course of my life lonely. Any thoughts, Duvid, on the role of shunning in Orthodox Judaism and what happens to people who essentially get thrown out of one Orthodox Jewish community? Does it uh, tend to spiral? Any thoughts on the, the, the fate of, say, the heretic or the rebel or the controversial figure in Orthodox Judaism, maybe even a Shmuley Boteach? Yeah, I mean, so there's different levels of heretics and outsiders. And just to me, I'm pretty sure it's ad populum fallacy, you know, the, the for uh, believing something because a lot of people are doing it. And, uh, you know, among Jews, we have different sources of authority. So we have, you know, the scripture, uh, you know, if you're more orthodox, it's Talmudic, uh, Shulchanoric, the law codes that uh, are determinative. But at the same time, like it's Jews and you could have a collection of Jewish friends that approach Judaism in whatever way and, and most jews probably approach it in the way that their parents approached it and, and in america that most secular jews um you're already generationally um secular approach their judaism you know like repair the world voter registration liberal activism type uh, elements that uh are uh, you know common because that's you know, people just follow and approach judaism the way that they understand it uh, the best, the way that they uh, were trained in it. And, uh, you know, so obviously the more orthodox, the more communal, and the more communal, the more something like shunning is uh, useful, like we showed in the get, and, and you know, it's kind of like it's a law, it's a, it's a Jewish law, you're supposed to shun the get refuser. Uh, I think there's a few other cases where shunning is an obligation i have to look up if shunning could actually be a mitzvah but it could be in certain circumstances shunning is actually a mitzvah and it's the general approach certainly in the u.s where judaism is voluntary um that you can't really have any legal repercussions for not following judaism so communally certainly um you know besides for like not hooking people up not giving them aliyahs a shunning is a pretty common method so like if you mess up um it's very likely everyone's going to know about it and you know that will diminish a person's reputation in standing in the group and these dynamics are common to all cultures judaism might have a unique approach to shunning one because we have our own way of honoring each other 
that you know your average person might care less about being honored the way that Jews honor each other. Um, but if you're a Jew and you care about you know getting Aaliyah or having your name in one of the dinner books or you know getting your kids into the schools or whatever it is, uh, then shunning could be an extremely effective measure. And shunning is a tribal strategy that doesn't work as well against me or you because we're more individuals that don't have a, a foot in the Jewish world with our family, as opposed to your common Jew who you know, was a member of the tribe and comes from large families. Shunning is much more effective, like we saw in those uh, videos about the get going after the guy's mother, God forbid, his sister, anybody in the community that helps him. So it's just me or you, um, you know, going after, trying to embarrass us in front of our family, God forbid, it's not going to work because probably just the fact that we're an Orthodox Jew is already an embarrassment, at least from the perspective um, of our family. So that, uh, you know, but shunning still could be useful in terms like, let's, let's as a group decide to not be so nice to this guy. You know, so if it, God forbid, you know, if you did something and, uh, you know, Rabbi Weil has to bounce you out, you know, Luke crossed the border and can no longer be a member of this congregation, um, verse, that's not really shunning, that's like a, a punitive action versus, uh, you know, like Luke, we don't really like his behavior, so let's collectively be a little less nice to him to encourage him to uh, change his behavior. So I actually think Jews are probably pretty expert at that, and there's, so to say, hard and soft shunning, where, where it's actually like, you messed up, you know, you're, you you have a ban on the synagogue, or, or you know, you can't get an Aaliyah, or your school, your kid's going to be kicked out of the school, uh, to something like, uh, you know, like the love bomb, like we had been really nice to you and really welcoming, uh, but then we realized that there were despicable things about your behavior. So in order to encourage you to change the behavior, we're going to, uh, you know, keep you at arm's length. Now, have you experienced shunning or have you participated in shunning others? I don't think I've really participated much in shunning others. I I've experienced shunning quite a few times because I'm an outsider. I've been, uh, you know, I was kicked out of, uh, you know, I've had people against me. I've had people publicly yell at me. I've had people publicly denounce me, um, mostly in New York. Like here in Detroit, I don't remember anyone publicly denouncing me, but you're probably more soft measures of, uh, you know, behind my back, just saying like, this guy's not so good, uh, you know, and, and I could feel the shunning. Um, you're not just in Orthodox Judaism, in all circles that like someone spoke to this person and said, uh, don't be so nice to him. Stay away from this guy. He's trouble. And, you know, sometimes it's a powerful person. It's a rabbi. It's a respected person. And then, and then God forbid, um, you know, bad karma is the worst. So if it's something you did or I did and they're shunning me because, like, I know I messed up versus uh, someone in the community who just, you know, doesn't like you and is going to have some sort of uh, pressure where, uh, you know, like the downtown synagogue where I, mean, I didn't mind like the liberal rabbi or anybody there. None of them were necessarily like, bad people. Uh, but at the end of the day, um, I wanted to move the synagogue in terms of like more, not necessarily Orthodox, but I, I at least wanted like Orthodox minion. And, and I mean, I was even liberal on a lot of things, but like I wanted to pray. I wanted the full davening. I wanted to learn Torah and various things. And the majority of the synagogue wanted, uh, you know, repair the world. So, uh, you know, there could be like light shunning in, in terms of, uh, you know, don't help this guy try to make a minion or, you know, various things. And, and God forbid, even like a shidduch, like, you know, God forbid from an Orthodox Jewish perspective, I'm probably pretty bad. So like, like, honestly, no one has ever, you know, as I say, read me a shidduch. No one has ever, you know, said like, why don't you date this girl? Why don't, uh, you know, the, uh, um, cause there's probably things about me that, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, at least dating that, uh, you know, someone's going to, advise and say like stay away from this guy and uh you know certainly the orthodox world where where uh that might be one of the bigger forms of making it difficult for a person to get married or making it you know difficult for their kids to uh get into the circles they want and, and maybe you've had more success uh dating um but at the same time you probably put yourself out there as like a moderate alternative you know like the convert uh who is only modern Orthodox, you know, you're clean shaven, or it may be at different periods for whatever reason, you know, you, you may have had more success with uh, people trying to set you up, even though you had a, a pretty, uh, I don't know what call it, toxic reputation, at least from Orthodox Jewish perspective, uh, but maybe in LA, um, you know, so to say at a certain point, the people who have sinned and messed up 
are way bigger than the people who haven't made any mistakes. So if you're, like, you're in LA and like people are like, oh, Luke Ford did a bad, a lot, you know, a lot of things that aren't becoming an open Orthodox Jew, but like relatively the majority of Orthodox Jews in LA probably do things that aren't becoming of an Orthodox Jew. So you might have, uh, you know, more, uh, leeway here and you know obviously detroit is a small community there's only a few thousand orthodox jews although there's like seventy thousand jews in metro detroit um you know there's only maybe less than five thousand orthodox jews so it's pretty uh um relatively kind of like closed circle so when i speak of my experience it's more from the memory of uh, you know new york where there are millions of jews and even you know I, we talked about the sub circuits in manhattan of uh, party people and uh you know even strippers and prostitutes because there's you know over a million jews there's hundreds of thousands of hasidim that there's sub circles of basically all former hasidim that uh, you know that that send together and so i assume that in la those are probably somewhat of the circles you you run together with where the people are like yeah we're orthodox but we don't do it the way you know we, we're kind of lax on a bunch of these rules and uh, that kind of like i mean from a pure like you know halakhic uh, orthodox perspective that's kind of like a uh, camaraderie among thieves uh, but he's like, like no i'm saying just like uh you know if we all i don't know like uh you know use our use uh you know kind of have late sabbath observance or various things that at a certain point it, you know we're just going to create our own sub circle of people that do it that way so in la or new york there's probably enough jews as opposed to detroit there's really not enough jews to have these uh you know, sub circles of uh, people with similar proclivities approaches to Judaism. Yeah, and I find that the word gets out pretty quickly. So if you clean up your act, things start to go better for you. If you find ways to be of service to the community, things to start start to go better to for you. So it's not like it, you know one one major mistake and you're you're done. So let me read a little bit more here from. This book on David Friedrich Strauss, the book is called The Father of Unbelief. So Strauss became a symbolic figure in Germany. The Orthodox, meaning the religious Orthodox, saw him as an antichrist. Liberal intellectuals regarded him as a martyr for free thinking. The free thinker was someone who was willing to take his thinking to its ultimate limits, who had the courage of his convictions, and who stated his views in public regardless of the consequences. This was an admirable ideal. But living by it was very dangerous in an age when religion was still closely guarded by the state. Strauss's sad life had become a warning to all. Watch what you say if you want to keep your reputation and your livelihood. Any thoughts on that passage, David? Um, I mean, not, not particularly. I mean, it sounded pretty good. Okay, I'll read a little bit more here from this Frederick Beiser book. The net effect of Strauss's book on his generation was to force it to make a choice. One could retreat under the banner of faith. But one could push forward with historical criticism. There was no middle path, however, where one could use reason to justify faith in the Bible. So Strauss grabbed the horn of historical criticism. He believed it was the duty of everyone to examine the grounds of morality and religion, and that it was impossible to rest content with the imposition of any arbitrary limit on inquiry. The modern individual could never accept the appeal to authority, whether it came from the state or the church, he could rely on their he could rely on his reason alone, which was the only criterion of assent. But was there not a danger that inquiry would never cease, that it would ultimately result in skepticism or nihilism? In the 1830s, Strauss was convinced that the quest for reason would ultimately end, that it would finally come to rest in Hegel's philosophy. And it's just so amusing for about 50 years in the first 50 years of the 19th century. For something to be regarded as ultimately true in Europe had had to accord with Hegel's philosophy. By the 1840s, however, Strauss had to abandon even that ultimate certainty. It was the fate of the modern individual, he now taught, to accept a life of limitless inquiry, which led to no ultimate certainty. Any thoughts, David? Yeah, I say first, like, the rationalist approach to Judaism is actually pretty rare. And, and to some extent, you have to have a lot of education to be worried about this stuff. So you know, from, from some perspective, you're like Judaism obviously has a lot of logical problems. And from, you know, if you're trying to prove that Judaism is true, it might be quite difficult. Um, but your average Jew, and because 
most elements of Judaism are very rational, even though the axioms that we make are you know, very difficult to substantiate that the, the process of being a Jew usually involves quite a bit of logic and even, you know, Orthodox Jew, can you do this? Can you do that? Um, how should I deal with the situation? So it's constantly reasoning versus you know, like a pure evaluation of is this true or not? So uh, you most Jews probably, you know, on their heart, like, you know, I think it's true. I think I'm going to go to heaven. I think Jews are special. I think that I do get rewarded for doing these things. And then, you know, like a dissonance approach If the dissonance, uh, you know, like, do you really believe this is true? That there's kind of the fallback of like, well, tribal, it, it makes for a good life. Um, it keeps me you know, disciplined or all the various reasons that a person uh, may approach it. Uh, but, you know, the pure you know, rationalist is, uh, may have heard from my, my your father who had even you know, briefly looked into converting or reform. And he just says like, I don't believe it. I don't, I don't believe that the religion is true like that. And, you know, as someone who has a claim to like logic um, or science, that it wouldn't make sense for him to convert to something that he doesn't think is true, you know, in the sense that, you know, the Torah in the generic narrative of the Bible in Judaism, that, you know, if you're born a Jew or you are a Jew, if it's not true, oh, okay. But like, it, but, uh, you know, if you're going to convert to Judaism, you say like, it's not true. You still might do it, but like, but uh, you know, relatively it becomes much more difficult. So that, you know, like the few academics like Maimonides, even historically, most of the famous commentators don't even deal with this. You have Maimonides and, and a few others. Um, so today, I think what you're talking about is probably really only relevant in like the halls of Judeo studies, or you know, we we'll call like masculine, like people who read books like me or you, people are really interested in knowing the truth. And that's probably a vast minority, even like far less than 5% of Jews. Right. Okay, let me read a little bit more from this book. So uh, Strauss protested that uh, destroying the historical foundations of the New Testament would necessarily destroy Christianity. So he wrote in the first paragraph of the final chapter of his book, The Life of Jesus, the results of the previous investigation, it appears, is that everything the Christian believes about Jesus has been destroyed, that all encouragement his faith has given him has been taken away, that he is robbed of all consolation, the infinite treasure of truth and life, which have nourished humanity for the last 18 centuries, appears to have been turned to waste, the most sublime truths crushed into dust, the mercy of God and the dignity of man have been lost, and the bond between heaven and earth has been torn into shreds. So both Judaism and Christianity build themselves as historical religions that uh, God entered into history. How much would it affect the truth and viability of Judaism if many of the historical details in the Hebrew Bible, in the Torah, turned out to be incorrect, David? We probably very little because I mean most of the experts have already determined that most of the stories in the bible are inaccurate and even like we've been talking about the, the jewish people um are the jews today actually jews or descendants of, of the jews even that's widely dis, uh, disbelieved you know noam chomsky the other week in a debate questioned whether he's actually a descendant of uh <coughs> the biblical jews let alone like the narrative the exodus and uh our legends um but in a christian world it's a lot more sensical to be Jewish or an Islamic world than an atheist world. Good. I mean, sometimes the atheistic world, it might make sense to be Jewish also. But, uh, you know, if you're looking at, like, I'm a Jew, I know there's a lot of holes in my religion. Um, but it appears to me there's a lot more holes in Christianity than Judaism. So I, I think there's some reinforcement level of a Jew who questions, do I really believe this stuff? in comparison to Christianity. So well, if all these Goyim believe in this religion, um, it could strengthen how much a Jew believes in Judaism. And also like the Christian or Jewish approach, it becomes largely historical that uh, most Jews, when they believe, it's based on an understanding of providence, a God who has been together with us in uh, you know history and reciprocates and rewards and punishes uh, you know the Jews as individuals and as a collective based on how well we behave and that's most seen through interpreting you know, the historical narrative you know through the prophets through the modern day 
And uh, so from that perspective, Judaism, maybe even Christianity, is basically historically true. You know, saying like, you know, like Noam Chomsky, so he may not be an actual Jew descended uh, from the ancient Israelites expelled by the Romans. Um, and that's pretty hard to prove. Uh, but he's certainly been a cultural Jew for generations that, you know, his father was a Hebrew scholar and he went to Hebrew schools in as far back in generations on both sides. You know, so like my mother, um, you know, to prove that she's Jewish is actually quite difficult. I don't even have, uh, you know, the marriage document of my mother's parents that if it was a legal matter of Israel proving that I was a Jew, they would probably want to see the ketubah from my grandparents' marriage, and I can't produce that. Um, that's a, a problem, and the rabbinic court in Israel might actually rule me non-Jewish because I can't produce that jo uh, document, not for the right of return, uh, but certainly, you know, my mother's 99.4% Ashkenazic Jewish, according to uh, 23 Me, and as far as we know, going back in any family uh, record, we were Jewish, uh, you know, on all sides. So uh, that historical narrative basically supplants you know, most Jews. Like, I'm a Jew because this is what I am. And looking into history, um, even though I can't prove the Bible is true and all those stories are true, it makes sense to me that that I'm a Jew and I've always been a Jew and my ancestors were always Jews. So does the chief rabbinate of Israel accept uh, DNA tests to make the case that you're Jewish? Well, possibly, but, but th there's a difference between Jewish... No, I don't think the chief rabbinate would. Um, th there's a difference between Jewish halakhically and Jewish for right of return. Uh, so, like, I mean, I, I, I was in Israel. Like, I'm pretty sure I got the right of return. I don't have any question about that. Uh, but if I wanted to marry in Israel, um, they might not rule me non-Jewish. God forbid they might rule me a mamzer. They would ask for documentation, and the main documentation that they want is usually the ketubah, the marriage contract between your parents. So my parents are, you know, my father's not Jewish. They didn't have a Jewish wedding like that. My parents don't have a ketubah. And my grandparents who are, you know, were uh, presumably 100% Jewish um, didn't have a ketubah. If they did, we don't have a record of it. So for administrating before the court, that might not matter for citizenship. But, but if I wanted to get married, in Israel, and I couldn't produce the document, and they told me, I'm sorry, you're a Suffolk moms, or, or uh, you know, something like that, you have to convert uh, Lechumra, you know, they call it that, uh, even, you know, Duvid's pretty obviously a Jew, um, but, uh, you know, for the Israel courts, I would have to do a conversion process again, just because I can't produce the documentation that, you know, basically all Orthodox Jews have no difficulty producing, you know, such as their married uh, parents' marriage contract. Okay, let me read a little bit more here from this book by Frederick Beiser on David Friedrich Strauss, The Father of Unbelief. So on the most basic level, there was nothing revolutionary or new about Strauss's method. It was well known and practiced by many of his contemporaries who called it simply the critical or the historical method. This is the method employed by all historians when they assess the authenticity and reliability of historical documents. Its chief task is to determine the quality of the evidence for a historical statement. It raises the simple and basic questions. What are the sources for this evidence? Are these sources credible? Who wrote these texts? What motives were there for writing them? And assuming the evidence is credible, is it sufficient for the conclusion drawn from it? These are the kinds of questions that are asked in a court of law to determine the merits of a case or that are raised by journalists to check the facts behind a story. So in the early 19th century, historians were eager to demonstrate the scientific status of their discipline. They began to raise these questions and to pursue them with more rigor and thoroughness than ever before. The two most celebrated historians to use this method were Barthold Niebuhr and Leopold Rank. So Niebuhr applied this test to Roman history, to Livy's famous narrative about the origins of Rome. Rank engaged in this with regard to the story of uh, Renaissance Italy. As a result of their investigations, these two historians found these traditional sources to be completely unreliable, partly because they were filled with fabrications and myths, partly because they passed off mere speculations as if they were facts. So essentially what Niebuhr did for ancient history, what Rank did for modern history, Strauss did for the New Testament. So the methods he employed were the same as basic uh, German 
historical scholarship. So his method was to determine whether the New Testament could be regarded as a reliable historical document. So he demanded that the Bible meet the same standards of evidence as any historical writing. So he insisted that his inquiry was presuppositionless, meaning he did not want to prejudice his investigation either for or against the New Testament. So whether it was a reliable historical document would have to be the conclusion, not the starting point of his investigation. So the traditional and the orthodox assumption about the Bible is that it is the product of supernatural inspiration written under the guidance of God and therefore an infallible historical source. So rather than granting this assumption, he went on to investigate it. He said we could prove the divine authority of the Bible only by determining whether its contents were historically true. We could just not simply assume that its contents are true because the Bible has divine authority. Any thoughts on that, David? Yeah, it's pretty interesting. And, and I, I, obviously, I guess this is historical because, you know, now since the creation of the state of Israel and all these universities with archaeology departments, that uh, Israel is the main source of, uh, you know, so to say, Jewish heresy. And most Israeli scholars, um, you know, completely agree with Strauss that the Bible is, you know, like made up and, in, in, uh, you know, by various uh, people or sages or groups based on bias and now the evidence uh you know has increased you know over jews being in israel 70 years and lots of archaeological uh, findings but to some extent the religion pushes on that uh, you have a small element of uh you know people like me or you that probably likes the scholarship because i like the religion and i'll read the heretical scholarship um because it, i think it does make me a better jew um but it's tough to say you know what what uh what the value you know, who's the target audience for such scholarship you know even judaic uh, judaic studies who takes judaic studies and and as i said to a large extent your know, judaism as as you were reading is kind of propaganda that the jewish literature is basically propaganda um and most jewish media and jewish studies is largely propaganda you know, because if you're going to take it from a pure scholarly approach, uh, you're just just the facts. Um, you know, it's difficult to find sponsorship, or it's just uh, not not as popular. And then, who's your target audience? That uh, who wants to uh, you know just hear a bunch of facts about the history of uh, Judaism, and especially if it's not true, uh, what's the value of it? So, studying Judaism, if you think Judaism isn't true, like a lot of the people, I, th I think Marshall was in the chat again yesterday. And he was mentioning he's like reading up on Israel and, you know, he's he's studying Judaism because he sees the influence of Jews on society, at least, you know, his perspective. And he sees it's nefarious from his perspective. And he's investigating the religion to just be like, who are these Jews? What do they believe? Even though at the moment he basically isn't even uh, conceiving the possibility that Judaism is a true religion. So, you know, most people who study Judy, like if it's me, who is, I want to know who I am, how do we get here? Um, you know, even just like a simple question, like how are there millions of blue-eyed Jews? I thought we came from Israel. How is it today that there's millions and millions of Jews with blue eyes? And, uh, you know, you could demand some sort of historical explanation. How is, it, how is that possible? Um, so if you're just there today, like, okay, I live in Metro Detroit, and or, or you know, you're in L.A., and you're like, you know, like, there's ten, there's probably tens of thousands, maybe over a hundred, probably hundreds of thousands of blue-eyed Jews in LA. And he's like, how did that come to be? Like, I thought Jews were Middle Eastern people. So how is there hundreds of thousands of blue-eyed Jews today? And from the religious perspective, like it doesn't matter. Like they're Jews, this is their religion, this is what they follow, versus trying to come up with some sort of historical explanation. And a lot of times the explanation is not going to match what the people believe. So it becomes conflicted. Where you say like you believe a lie, you think that you're descended from the you know the, the Israel prophets or, or this or that, and the evidence says otherwise. So so the Judaic uh, studies could be used as an axe, usually not because usually it's paid for by Jews. So it has to you know, have some sort of utility reason to say well what's the benefit of doing this analysis if it's going to show that the religion is false. And then what do you do with the followers of the religion who don't give a crap that you just did an analysis that shows the religion's probably false? Okay, great. So there's 
an article in Moment magazine came out in 2014. James Kugel, professor of disbelief. So James Kugel is Sephardic. The Sephardim have uh, always had a little bit more room for biblical scholarship. Michael Orbach writes, when I was a teenager, there was a legend repeated in the Jewish schools of my hometown. If you somehow manage to get into godless Harvard, don't go. But if, against your Rosh Yeshiva and Rebbe's advice, you actually go, whatever you do, don't take biblical scholar James Kugel's class. If you do, you'll walk into Introduction to the Bible, see that the professor is wearing a yarmulke, and assume the course is kosher. And, the story goes, you'll walk out a heretic. So these days, James Kugel, a professor emeritus of classical and modern Hebrew literature at Harvard University, lives on a quiet street in Jerusalem. I had come to see him with a specific purpose. After an unremarkable career at a private modern Orthodox high school on Long Island, I spent a gap year at a very Orthodox yeshiva on an Israeli mountaintop, then attended another yeshiva not far from my parents' house. Things didn't turn out the way I thought they would. My yeshiva closed down, became a vacuum repair shop, and moved to a far more religious yeshiva that I left over philosophical differences. Eventually, my faith eroded. For me, the term losing one's faith is a misnomer. My faith slipped away as if I were holding on to a precipice and lost my grip finger by finger. I couldn't hold on, no matter how much I tried. James Kugel had an ens ens ancillary role in this drama. His mammoth 2007 book, How to Read the Bible, an encyclopedic study of the Bible from both a traditional and academic perspective, seemed a confirmation of what I had come to think, but was afraid to say aloud that the Torah was written by man and that all the laws and regulations that we as Orthodox Jews followed were simple, simply constructions based around that. For someone who was raised to believe that the written Torah and the oral Torah that accompanied it were divine, the realization was devastating. Any reaction, David? Yeah, it becomes very problematic because, I mean, it, the one interest is, like, yeah, who's this guy teaching for? So, I mean, really, you know, like Mark Shapiro, like really he's just doing it to make money. He probably doesn't really have a target audience. He was probably just someone who really wanted to get ahead and, you know, like Judaism and studying it and ends up, you know, like a professor like Mark Shapiro, or now he's at Harvard, uh, but he doesn't really have any followers. He doesn't have someone for the message except for someone else who's trying to get ahead in social climb. You know, like if you want to reach the top of Harvard or something like this information will be very useful to them. So, you know, at the point they've already became somewhat like a heretic and they're probably a negative force to Orthodox Jews because even from, they could look at it from their perspective, like, you know, God forbid, like the Holocaust and anti-Semitism is that, uh, you know, like people want to know about the Hasidim in Brooklyn. You know, like all, all these movies that Peter Santanello, and he's saying people don't know much about the Hasidim. They want to know more. And so if you ask the Hasidim, like what we believe, or, you know, try to look at our books versus you're going to go to a scholar and you know, say, you don't need to ask them. I'm going to explain to you who these people are, uh, how they came to believe, what they believe, and what the real truth is. So, uh, you know, from the certain perspective, his job is basically, uh, you know, thankless, that, that, that there is no one who's going to give a thank you. There might be like me or Luke, or like, yeah, I enjoyed your book, uh, but no one's going to make this guy his rabbi and, and probably it's mostly covet and honor he's at harvard and he's you know probably teaching uh teaching shiksos and, and various uh things so uh yeah i appreciate the scholarship but when you look at the bias or the narrative voice usually these people these scholars like, like mark shapiro he doesn't have any narrative voice in his literature he's just a guy who studied this stuff really hard and writes books on it even though he doesn't really believe it and uh or or you know, for some alternative purpose, like, you know, he's a Jew and he's really scared of rising anti-Semitism and he knows that he thinks Orthodox Jews are bad and Orthodox Jews are causing rising anti-Semitism. So he has to write all these books to explain to the Goyim how, you know, even though Orthodox Jews follow a false religion, that uh, you don't have to hate them and you don't have to, uh, you, you know, God forbid, uh, uh, be anti-Semitic against us. So to some respect, I don't have that much respect and, and and usually these scholars are in my opinion become scholars because of their negative character that they fall into the position they might be successful you know so he's at harvard mark shapiro went to harvard you know like i didn't get into harvard good for him 
but when he gets into that uh you know what what is his value proposition who is he speaking to um it's pretty unclear and uh, and then you have like the jewish apologetics so is he just gonna he's not gonna be the same as like an anti-semite you know like a like a german rationalist who's just looking uh, you know who are these jews in our, our territory what is the origin of their practices and where do they come from because presumably you know the guy the guy's jewish they want to say there's something good about judaism and even though it's a false religion even though it's historically not true that this false vehicle uh you know, really caused a bunch of good things to happen like uh, the famous uh, benjamin disraeli quote uh you know what well your ancestors were savages in in uh, in england you know our, his ancestors were serving in king solomon's temple so even though benjamin disraeli thought you know king solomon's temple was probably retrospectively pretty ridiculous but at the time king solomon's temple was way more advanced than anything anyone else had in the in the role well you, you don't mention what seems to me the most obvious uh motivation for, for these scholars is that they wish to pursue the truth wherever it leads is that a possibility that you simply discount no because almost all these guys are like propaganda and and and, and, and they usually defend the claims like the people in, in your chat you're saying like uh well, if Judaism is a false religion, what's wrong with anti-Semitism? So usually the scholars at the same time are attacking anti-Semitism and attacking Orthodox Jews at the same time. And, and it makes it almost impossible to think that they're looking after troop and kind of like Mark Shapiro, like, you know, all this, he's pushing these, uh, you know, Shiner and his buddies that are going around, uh, you know, trying to, uh, you know, do these uh, Hasidic things. But then at the same time, he's saying like that's not true, like that that's a uh, you know not, not real Judaism, because he needs uh, he needs to be part of something. So he chose to be part of uh, you know some group of uh, ultra Hasidic, ultra Orthodox people. But at the same time, he's preaching a message that's much more moderate. So I think anyone watching you would see this guy's intellectually being disingenuous because he's not going to um, he's going to avoid the JQ. You know, for that perspective. So if you're a Jewish scholar and you're looking for truth, you have to take the JQ head on. And almost none of these Jew, uh, Judaic scholars actually take the JQ on, in my, my impression, even the ones you're reading from. Well, the advantage to your approach here is that you're attacking them on their motives, which cannot be ascertained. So you can say anything here about their motivations, and it can't be disproved one way or another. You could say that they were motivated by little green men who work on Mars, you could say that they're being motivated by their fear of the lizard people who, who live and work in the bowels of the earth. You can say absolutely anything about people when you attack their motivations because there's no way of providing concrete evidence for somebody's motivation. On the other hand, the downside to this approach is that it's not useful because there's no, there's no way of ascertaining whether anything that you just said bears any relationship to reality because you're dealing in the murky world of human motivation. So what motivates you you may not even be, you're likely only conscious of maybe 5% of what motivates you. I'm only conscious of a tiny little bit of what motivates me. So the idea that we could know other people's motivation just seems to me a ludicrous and wasteful exertion of energy to try to analyze because there's no way you can ever ascertain anything. This is all unprovable. It's unascertainable. It is just, uh, just empty theorizing we can never find out if we have moved even one centimeter close to the truth david well i mean i agree with that i mean talmud says uh you know clearly you can't know what's on a person's heart and i, I was just speculating about their motivation by saying from their overall scholarship and the personality that they don't appear to have a logically consistent perspective like they're just searching for for truth because there's usually blatant elements um that would uh negate that the person is searching for truth like dealing with uh, kevin mcdonald or something like that that no you know jewish scholar is going to seriously look at uh, kevin mcdonald and, and give it a rebuttal because because uh, because you know if, if or various elements of the jq or, or various questions that uh, are, are kind of axiomatic to jewish studies you know, so so to you know, just the just the question, you know, like, uh, um, does it make sense that there's millions of blue-eyed Jews that are 
Jewish by blood. And just so it's like a simple question like that. So you're like, okay, like you're telling me Mark Shapiro uh, is a Jew. Like, look at those blue eyes. Even even the Sparty guy that you quoted, uh, Kugel at Harvard had blue eyes. And you said, that guy's a Jew. And, uh, but I mean, whatever perspective you take it, these people aren't going to uh, address the difficult questions that most people want to know about Judaism. Most people want to know about Judaism, the JQ, and they want to know, um, you know, the type things that we talk about on this show, like what, what, what we answer to Richard Spencer and Patrick Little. Most people aren't really concerned with what the Jewish scholars are looking at. So saying what they're putting so much work into uncovering, so to say, the truth, but at the same time that usually their actions uh, belie uh, the, that, uh, you know, that they're really on a conquest uh, for, for truth. And you have like, the, you know, like evolution and all these various uh, real complicated, difficult issues to assess in uh, in Judaism that I would say most Judaic scholars, uh, you basically avoid because they're going to make these assumptions in their axioms that are somewhat ungrounded. Okay, I want you to just mute for a couple of minutes. I have to go to the door. I'm just going to play something. So just please mute. I'll be right back in two or three minutes. It's just kind of interest group jockeying for public resources. Right? Yeah. Beyond that, there wasn't resentment of Christian people and there wasn't a sense of threat from right. Christian people. Where right. I could, and, and there's an interesting anecdote about that, which is I remember very well um, in my public school, you know, it might as well have been a Christian school. I mean, we had the full Christmas pageant and we sang right. Christmas carols and right. you know, we, we, we rose for the hallelujah chorus and all that. None of this was considered traumatizing in the least, um, <laughs> except my mom, who was a lot more kind of left than my dad. She started to grumble about it and say, you know, this is inappropriate. They shouldn't be having our Jewish children doing this and singing these songs. And my dad said, Judy, just like suck it up. They got here first. It's their country. You know, we just live in it. And it's I, a damn good place. I am happy to be here. He said, I am so happy to be here. So just forget it. Stop complaining. That's what he used to I remember I would I would listen to these conversations with utter fascination. So I have to say that I took my father's part in this. I truly did. So uh, yeah, I, don't mean, I don't mean to, no, excuse me, Paul, I just have to say, uh, there's quite a bit of stuff for us on Streamlabs, so I'm going to have to make the last call now for uh, reasonable responsible questions or comments. Fellas, please do put them uh, on Streamlabs as soon as you can. The last call is made. And uh, there's some really a lot of interesting stuff here from the viewers, and there's so much of them that I have to put a stopwatch on uh, response, as much as I hate doing that, to uh, about uh, probably 90 seconds. And when the watch is up, I will do an interesting chime with this uh, ink well in my glass. So uh, it won't be, you know, in the spirit of... Okay, I am back. Let's uh, return here to the conversation with Duvid. Let me go to this essay in Moment magazine about James Kugel, a professor of Bible at Harvard for many years. And the essay writes, I was intrigued that James Kugel could be both an Orthodox Jew, one of the most impressive biblical scholars of our times. Seemingly, this means reconciling the unreconcilable. Orthodox Jews believe, as Maimonides articulated in his 13 Principles of Faith, that the Torah came from God. Modern biblical scholars, on the other hand, have spent the past century deconstructing it, putting forth various theories of the historical origins of the sacred text. According to one of the most widely accepted views, the five books of Moses are not written by the prophet himself, but are a compilation of four independent parallel narratives assembled over several centuries. While non-Orthodox denominations have absorbed this scholarship into their theology, there remain orthodox circles where this kind of analysis is considered heresy. Kugel seems underwhelmed when I ask him how he remains an orthodox Jew. The only way to square this circle is the traditional way, he explains. Our rabbis didn't say that understanding the Torah and interpreting the Torah was something that was up in the air. They established how to read the Bible in an orthodox, I should say, Jewish way, through the lens of rabbinic interpretation, and that, in a sense, is a whole new text. So, Kugel writes, my own view is that modern biblical scholarship and traditional Judaism are, must always remain, completely irreconcilable. The whole attitude underlying such speculation is altogether alien to the spirit of Judaism and the role of scripture. Any thoughts, David? You just need to unmute, David. Wait, sorry, but I mean, yeah. to put it as alien to say that Within an orthodox perspective, you could understand why people believe false things. And in certain orthodoxy, you know, Hasidus uh, Kabbalah has large explanations for why people believe false things. So if you're orthodox 
and you're just like, evolution is 100% false. Only a moron would believe that. But the reason why most people believe evolution is because they're perverts. They just want to have sex with no repercussions. So from orthodox, it's not, you know, there's not some uh, you know, dichotomy that you can't uh, understand evolution or rationalism as an orthodox Jew. You just think that what we believe is true and what those people believe is false. And the reason they believe it is because, not, you know, to say because they're bad people or have um, bad character. And to the similar extent, that's kind of what uh, secular Judaic scholars are saying, that orthodox Jews are kind of just dumb, that, that no one in their right mind would actually believe this stuff um, but due to historical reasons or due to the ability of these people just not quite being intelligent enough to understand logic clearly, they follow this, uh, you know, so to say, um, false religion. But, but you know, like, if you're a monotheist, there is no source for this alternative vision except basically the desire to sin. So, you know, if you're an Orthodox Jew, it's like, well, I'm not so smart. I can't, uh, you know, I'm not going to beat JF in a, in a debate. I'm not going to, you know, go in modern day debate and defend Judaism and beat these guys. Um, but I still believe. And I think that the reason that these guys um, are on the opposite side of me is probably because they're, you know, bad people or just because they can't control their urges and desires. And therefore they attack the truth of religion in order to, uh, you know, make an excuse for their inability to control their desires usually sexual desires, although, you know, it could be anything that uh, a person is is weak on. And, and Kugel is like an Orthodox Jew. It's, I never even heard of the guy. And like, what does it mean to be Orthodox? And, and but it's certainly he's probably good for the Jews, just like Mark Shapiro, that you were saying, the guy went to Harvard, the guy's respect among Jews. And there's a utility that if you're good for the Jews, will include you under the banner of Orthodox, even if you're not. But, it, you know, but it's got to be temporary because only when you're good for the Jews are they going to include you. And when you're no longer good for the Jews, um, you know, they may uh, not include us. OK, let me read a little bit more from this article from Moment magazine back in 2014. James Kugel's ideas cast a long shadow over academia and the public, even reaching into my relatively sheltered Orthodox world. This was due in part to the fact that Kugel is one of the rare academics who is accessible to a popular audience. At Harvard, he was wildly popular among students and even ran a friendly competition with an economics professor to see who could bring the most students into the classroom. One semester when Kugel's class had 975 students compared to the economics class with 950, the student newspaper, the Harvard Crim Crimson, ran the headline, God Beats Mammon, reference to the New Testament's false god and material wealth. A 2004 profile in Harvard Magazine described James Kugel's teaching style as Woody Allen in a state of grace. Kugel always began his courses by saying, if you come from a religious tradition upholding the literal truth of the Bible, you could find this course disturbing. This is why the heavily trafficked religious Jewish news site Vosses Nice dubbed him perhaps the most famous living controversial Epicurus heretic in the world. So he has published such books as The God of Old, The Ladder of Jacob, and How to Read the Bible. The New York Times called this book awesome, thrilling, and deeply strange. Harvard cognitive scientist Steven Pinker used it as a key source for his 2011 bestseller, The Better Angels of Our Nature, Why Violence Has Declined. I found Kugel's book invaluable, says Steven Pinker, reported both traditional interpretations and the latest scholarship on provenance and historical fidelity of biblical narratives, and it was written with an appealing voice, respectful of the scholarship, but with frequent touches of irreverent, irreverence and wit. Any thoughts, David? Yeah, I'm, I'm remembering now as you say this, because uh, you know, like I'd done pretty good on my SATs, although I failed at getting into Harvard. I applied to Harvard, and you know when I was in yeshiva, like you know, like I, I was recognized as pretty smart that I just chose to go to yeshiva, even though I could have went to a good university and. Uh, People used to bash Harvard. I remember in Israel, like in Brisk Yeshiva, um, I, I knew some people and they would sit around bashing Harvard, you know, Tim, like, yo, you're pretty smart. Uh, and like I told Charles Moskowitz the other day um, when he was talking about Sholem Dean and New Square, that maybe he wasn't trained to have a livelihood or, or to do anything uh, besides be Hasidic, but that's not the case in like Satmar or Bubov. I even mentioned Bubov Yeshiva relatively. Um, I mean, they don't, 
really have a course in construction management or being a landlord. Uh, but I would proverb that uh, a graduate of a good yeshiva understands business, the landlord business, better than they could teach you at Harvard. And if you're going to say, like, the perspective of us is nice, there is 0% chance that you're learning anything useful about Judaism at Harvard. Um, you know, it's just like a process that you have to go through the Orthodox lifestyle. And so from their perspective, these guys are kind of like Kugel's like a diversion agent of. Uh, and so if you're a Jew, you're saying like, there is no way these guys are ever going to figure out. I don't care if he's the best professor at Harvard. He knows crap. There's no way he knows crap about Judaism. So in Brooklyn, um, I used to hear that all the time. And, and there probably is some truth to that, that uh, if Kugel walked into a Hasidic based medrash in Brooklyn, like if someone knew him, maybe he would be honored. But like, you know, they just look at him as a goy. Maybe he speaks some Yiddish. Maybe he could daven. Um, I don't even know if like, you know, does he know how to, uh, you know, he calls himself an Orthodox Jew. Does he know how to lead the prayer service? Maybe he does. And maybe that's why he could get away with doing these things. And even though he's a heretic. Um, and I think that's a greater heretic, a heretic that actually leads Hebrew prayers as opposed to someone who can't. But just say that perspective of us is nice. And in Brooklyn, it's just like, oh, these stupid Goyim at Harvard that listening to this idiot. Don't they realize that us in Brooklyn understand Judaism a thousand times better than this guy and these idiots at Harvard that think that uh, this guy knows something? And uh, to some perspective, I agree with him on that, that uh, like Kugel... Um, I never even heard of him, honestly. I mean, I knew a Chabad, I think Rabbi Kugel in, in Manhattan, maybe they're uh, related. Uh, you know, Kugel is a German word for like the, you know, like potato Kugel, Luxion Kugel. Um, but uh, I got to say, I had generally had that, you know, attitude. Like you were part of a seven-day Adventist, you know, so the cultic society where they had a little commune and everyone followed seven-day Adventism. And so if you heard that there was this great scholar at Harvard um, you know, heretic on Seventh Day Adventism. I don't think your average guy would really think that the, that just because he's at Harvard, um, he's going to understand uh, you know Judaism that well. So, to some perspective, I appreciate the Hasidic attitude that just like Harvard Schmarvard, this guy doesn't know anything about Judaism. Yeah, average people aren't very smart. So, all the people who are speaking in that disrespectful, mocking tone, none of them get paid tens of thousands of dollars to be a scholar in residence. James Kugel makes tens of thousands of dollars a year being a scholar in residence at Orthodox synagogues all over the world. So ignorant people are going to say ignorant things. That uh, does not well, I'd say the me. opposite even. That, that is saying like, the, he is probably the ignorant. I mean, saying that no, because you don't appreciate the scholarship among Haredi Jews to know that uh, really his scholarship isn't that great. And maybe you don't appreciate the wealth. You know, okay, where, you, where is he ignorant? Where is he wrong? Well, I never even heard of the guy until you mentioned him. So, like, like I, mean, I could read his books, but I'm just saying the generic attitude and saying, like, if you were, that is very unlikely he went through the process of mastering the Hebrew text like a Haredi person. I haven't read his work to uh, uh, test his knowledge. And then even, to, you know, from a business perspective, if you're a Hasidic guy in Brooklyn um, and you see these people going to Harvard, he's like, besides for Bloomberg, they're not that rich. There's a lot of extremely wealthy Hasidic people with very little education, you know, landlords, import export business, and they look like Harvard's a bad investment. I don't think you're going to go to Harvard and, uh, and and become a mega landlord. I think you're going to go to Harvard and uh, and end up in in a bunch of debt. And I'm not necessarily that uh, you may I agree with your assessment that you know generally the wise man learns more from the fool than the wise man. The fool thinks that the wise person is dumb. But the perspective is like, no, I mean, there's really not that much to learn from Judaism at Harvard. So if you have an anomaly, this really high IQ guy that knows a lot of stuff, um, and you say you can't really be an outsider to Judaism and be an expert in it uh, from that you know perspective of uh, like it's a cultic type group. And if you're not a member, how much scholarship do you really expect uh, a person to have? And, and the type of scholarship that matters among Kareidim, maybe like having stuff memorized, uh, where, where you say that, uh, you know, like a Hasidic kid has most of the dabbing memorized, uh, even though, you know, saying that, no, I mean, your average person at Harvard probably does not have as much memorized as your, you know, say upper, better Kareidi student. I know that in Jerusalem, like they have, uh, like they train those kids and they memorize large amounts of text. 
And from the Harvard perspective, like that, well, that doesn't matter. That's just dumb. Uh, but from the Grady perspective, um, I've never seen any of those guys get any respect. And I remember they would just be bashed and bashed. And a lot of times they were bashed because they didn't even have any money. So I mean, it's one thing if you actually went to Harvard and now you're rich. But a lot of cases in, you know, like the five towns in Brooklyn that you go to Harvard and you still don't have more money than the Orthodox guys who reject you. So you're saying Jews bash people if they're not rich. What he's saying that you know, like, no, you go to Harvard to become a Jewish scholar. It's like no one respects a Jewish scholar. So I mean, if you're great, it's okay. Like God forbid, maybe he's having sex with the girls in his class or something like that. At least like that's something to show for his efforts. Um, but but uh, you know, like a covet among Jews, there's no honor in being a Judaic studies professor at Harvard. And uh, and, and either he's a bad man because he's peddling. Um, things to the goyim. Probably the majority of the people who listen to him are goyim. So uh, you know, it's definitely going to make a Haredi person like, who is this heretic? Who is this person that you know doesn't even have a following? Claims he's orthodox, and then he just peddles a bunch of heresy to goyim. Uh, so uh, usually, you know, even say like you said, Vos is nice, a very negative view towards these Judaic scholars, and and it might even classify him. He might have some. I don't know enough about him to you know that like is he going to be an anti semite? already said like oh you know he's an evil man and he's an anti-semite and he's doing it because he's evil the whole reason he's going to harvard and writing his scholarship is because he's jealous and harbors hatred of orthodox jews in his heart and that's really what's driving him and that's a pretty common jewish interpretation around the board for like anti-semitism you know people are jealous they have hatred in the heart because they're jealous and that would probably be the general view towards this guy in, in a Haredi world that, oh, because he couldn't get, get accepted and respecting the Haredi world, he had to go and teach a bunch of goyim. And the goyim are so dumb that they let this idiot tell him stuff about Judaism that's not even true and they think he's all smart. So anyone who thinks that the most popular professor at Harvard University is dumb, I mean, that person's a moron. So a lot of people are morons. Now, you are articulating a, a very uh -huh. common uh, attitude Bertrand. Bertrand insular did. event groups have this kind of attitude that if people don't follow us then they're morons sorry go ahead well i mentioned that i mentioned uh you know when we were studying rambam like the the, the wealthy bertrand family in brooklyn and they were kind of you know it, god forbid charlie bertrand uh, blessed memory passed away of covid uh and his cousin shimon bertrand who's you know got manages billions of real estate right now and yeah the money issue is uh is probably the big deal because like if you're in an orthodox culture and you're saying there's no value to what this guy did if he made money off of it maybe so uh you, you're like i don't know if you you take that attitude but saying like within orthodoxy to some extent you can measure a person by the size of his wallet and bank account and if this guy's at harvard and he's so smart and he's not rich he's really not so smart and uh and honestly i think that's a good thing to judge you know, like not, and I'm not saying that don't, don't, you know, judge people, you, people have to have good character and be good people. Uh, but yeah, to a certain point, um, it's a good thing that we judge people based off the size of their wallet. And Bertrand's right that, uh, you know, he's got more money than this guy. And uh, he said, Oh, he understands Judaism so well, then how come he, then how come he's not rich? And I'm, I'm, I'm sure Kugel's uh, upper middle class, or he might even uh, be rich, but I'm defending that attitude to you know to say like no i mean th like this guy really doesn't deserve any respect and your average orthodox jew that uh, thinks this guy doesn't deserve any respect it's not necessarily because he's dumb he might just look at things of differing importances and say like this guy's really dumb he went to harvard and he didn't even make money off of it and well so most, most like, talmudic rabbis were poor so do orthodox jews despise talmudic rabbis because they were poor so well, what you're articulating is just a, a childish perspective, because if James Kugel was a billionaire, um, these morons that you're articulating their point of view, they would find something else to attack him for. So if he was a billionaire, if he had every word of the Tanakh memorized, if he had every every word of the G Gemara memorized, if he had every word of every major rabbinic commentator memorized, if he was a billionaire, if he had you know, 17 children who are all Siddiquim, they would still look for something else to rubbish him on. So all the arguments that you're just articulating, they all mean nothing because if they weren't true, people would just switch and seek out a different argument. When when people want to blindly hate, 
they will try to attack someone say he's not rich but if he is rich they'll just switch then they'll say oh but he has a child who's an epicurus a, a heretic but if if say all his children are sadikim and the guy's rich and he's successful they'll just keep looking for something to attack him on but none of these attacks mean anything these are just the, the blind splutterings of people who are moronic and have bad character. Well, so, and that's the point, is that this guy is basically an anti-Semite, yeah, because the Karate people are representative of true Judaism. So you have this anti-Semite at Harvard. Wait, 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 wait. Before you call him an anti-Semite, on what basis? You need to provide a basis for calling someone you know, a name like that. Well, I mean, because he besmirches the, the good reputation of Karadian Orthodox Jews that actually believe this stuff. Okay, where does he do that? But I mean, it's like apicorsis. I mean, and, and anti-Semite's like a generic word, uh, but, but it's saying if he's saying bad things about... So it's about another the, word that doesn't mean anything. So all you're doing is well, venting no, it does that, that people that hate he, this guy and they're just going to invent reasons to hate him because you're calling him an anti-Semite without being able to provide any justification for it i mean is, isn't no, that the like pure really bad sign he's teaching of character torah to goyim. To... he's teaching torah to goyim that's punishable by death in the talmud the very books that he's teaching say he should be put to death who is this crazy stupid man that's at harvard and thinks he's something because he teaches torah to goyim what precedents in the judaism do you have for such a thing yeah so and how many how many people of the jewish community put to death for teaching torah to, to goyim over the past thousand years you're plucking well, no, something I mean, not, out of a Gomorrah, one know, but, but random think, event that doesn't is not applicable today. You're just spewing all sorts of things that you're making no up that have zero Dorium. basis in reality. No you're besmirching a man with no basis. You, you have no foundation for anything you're saying. If one fact truth proves to be wrong, you're just spewing all sorts of other things. And it doesn't even matter to you whether or not there's any factual foundation for these horrible things that you're saying about someone. How are you not ashamed and embarrassed by that kind of behavior? Well, I mean, because it's not necessarily what I think. I'm just saying I lived in Karate society, and I heard the majority of my mentors used to bash Harvard and yeah. used to bash people like this and saying they weren't you know, necessarily evil, uh, dumb people. Like, you know, saying like, like I mentioned Bertrand, who was actually quite wealthy and, and, and uh, respected uh, uh, businessman and, and other people that uh, didn't have much respect. And you know, what's in the tradition to say that what um, if you're a Haredi Orthodox Jew, there is nothing that Professor Kugel has done that uh, makes him worthy of respect. And, and in fact, you should look at him askew because basically he's uh, a suspect, uh, even like a moiser or snitch. But I mean, I mean, how do you defend his role in teaching Torah to Goyim? You think he's gonna like like he's gonna have this great respect among the Haredim because he's respected from the Goyim for teaching our secrets? He's a he's a professor at a university, and he teaches uh, Hebrew, and he teaches related topics like thousands of other people do in the United States. Probably twenty percent of whom are, are Jews. So this has been but going it goes on for against thousands of years. Historic Orthodox standards to teach Judaism to non-Jews, and, and almost certainly the vast majority of the people he teaches are going. Okay, so what does it mean to teach? First of all, I would just want to make clear something that you a point you made a minute ago. This is. What you've been articulating the last 15 minutes is not primarily how Duvid regards this man and this topic. You're articulating a very common Haredi and traditional Jewish perspective. So I just want to underline that. You, you made the point, this is not necessarily what I'm thinking. You're making the point, this is a very common communal reaction. So I just want to underline it. So when I was challenging and attacking the, the thought that you were articulating, it wasn't an attack on Duvid. It was an attack on this type of thinking, you weren't even necessarily making these remarks in your name. You were articulating a very widespread traditional Jewish perspective, which you have some sympathy for, but you, James Kugel was really irrelevant to everything that you were saying. That was just a pretext to illustrate a traditional insular community's perspective on these types of things, where you, you have an insular community, whether it's traditional Jews or traditional Seventh-day Adventists, they have a member from their community who receives you know, widespread acclaim in the secular world, but is teaching things that the traditional community is, you know, finds, finds uh, heretical. Is that fair, David? Did I kind of sum up what you, you've been Yeah, I mean, so I wanted to emphasize the point that, like, yeah, I lived in Brooklyn. People bashed Harvard and those type people for, for years. 
and a lot of them were successful and rich and had uh, you know big families and community to have some sort of, of backup and like you I mean my liberal rabbi went to harvard that's you know almost the biggest thing on her resume is that she went to harvard um i see people who went to harvard uh, you know all over the place they're they're usually in charge of me they're usually you know saying like this woman got put in charge of me largely because she went to harvard um but you know the approach even to professor kugel is probably general to judaic studies in general there's no honor in the in the you know i call the orthodox even that this guy calls himself orthodox um, but called the Haredi world, there's no respect given to Judaic studies professors. You don't even get an aliyah. In fact, you're probably a bad person and, and you know, because you're suspect. Like, who is this man that's sitting here um, lecturing to Goyim about what Judaism is when everybody knows that he's not properly telling them what Judaism is? So saying, why is he doing it? So you say, well, he's probably an evil man. He's probably doing it for uh, bad motives. But uh, you say, like, who is this man that doesn't represent Jews, doesn't uh, know any of us, doesn't uh, respect our rabbis. And then he goes and he tells the Goyim these things that we all know not to be true. So and you think that that guy's going to have respect from the Haredi you know, believing uh, community? And say even the opposite is saying like, no, I mean, the Haredim have a reason to be skeptical and uh, mad at this guy and say that this man's an evil man. This guy's a heretic. Uh, this guy is an enemy of Judaism, this man is purposely okay, saying repeating, false things repeating. about Judaism to Goyim. Well, I mean, because it's a point that it would make make that that uh, that like it's not necessarily my belief, but saying like, no, I mean, these guys are really hated in Karate circles. Yeah, and okay. if you're just going to say because Karate are dumb, they hate this guy because Karate are dumb, he's right in the Karate. No, wrong. those people who are artic- who are speaking the way that you uh, you spoke are moronic in that that respect. I mean, there are cogent critiques to make of uh, secular scholarship, et cetera. But the critique that, oh, he's not rich. I mean, that's that's a moron's critique. And as far as not being no, honored. There's no basis to be a Judaic studies professor. Like any person who went into Judaic studies, there's something wrong with him. Like why, why the hell would any uh, person with any sense who deserves to be respected into the Jewish community go into Judaic studies in desire to teach going? And uh, again, another moronic uh, take. Well, you I say mean, that's moronic? Yeah. That's, that's moronic, moronic to just... Yeah. But well, what's, like, what's wrong with teaching Jewish studies at Harvard University? Because there's severe prohibitions against teaching Judaism to Goyim. Ah, but what what is Judaism? That's, it's not just, oh, teaching Judaism to Goyim. If you teach, say, 15th century uh, European Ashkenazi poetry, is that uh, teaching Judaism to Goyim? It's not just these broad, you can't teach Judaism to Goyim. It has specific uh, meanings, and it, it, it has to do with the, the, the context, who you're teaching, how you're teaching. It's not just like some, some broad, broad prohibition. There are most, uh, not most, but a substantial portion of Jewish studies professors are orthodox. I am not aware of one ever being uh, exiled or excommunicated from orthodox Judaism for what they're doing. Yeah, but to actually exile, most of these people aren't in, in like, we could talk about Brooklyn, you know, talk about Haredim, people who oppose college in general. So, you if like, obviously, if you're talking modern Orthodox people that uh, respect going to university, if you're talking about people that think university is bad in general, you know, certainly there's going to be no respect for a Judaic professor, a professor of Judaic studies. So if you're going to... Um, you know, you're, you're going to classify, it's like, I'm sorry, Luke, you're an anti-Semite. If you think that these Jews who think that going to university are stupid, that's anti-Semitic because this is our religion. We think that this is our Judaism, and now you're calling us a moron because we're Jewish. Or So so here's this convert, uh, Luke Ford, because he listened to this professor at Harvard, he thinks he could attack the Karedom. And that's why this professor at Harvard is an evil man, because Luke Ford, without Professor Kugel, would not dare to attack the Karedom. And it's only because he could say, well, if this professor at Harvard attacks the Kuratum, he's probably right. Now, if you're in a synagogue that's largely composed of professionals, so doctors, lawyers, accountants, dentists, and uh, you're a plumber and you want to join the synagogue, you're not generally speaking going to get a lot of honor. So honor is entirely contextual. So you're pointing out that James Kugel in certain traditional Haredi Orthodox synagogues, it's not going to receive honor. Well, a Satmar walking into a Lubavitch yeshiva is not necessarily going to receive honor either. 
So a Sephardic rabbi walking into an Ashkenazi yeshiva is not necessarily going to receive honor either. A, a Orthodox synagogue that is primarily composed of millionaires is not generally going to accord honor to some uh, poor landscape worker who tries to join the synagogue. So honor is varies by, by context. So people who value scholarship, they are going to value scholars. People who value money are going to value people who are rich. People who value professional success are going to value people with professional success. People who value Torah observance are going to value people with Torah observance, whether they're rich or poor. Any thoughts on that thesis? Well, I think I mean I think it's even in the Talmud. I have to look it up. I mean, there's a statement that says, "Honor from the goyim is no honor," and you can't respect a person because they're honored from the goyim. That uh, if you see this person being honored by the goyim uh, from a Jewish perspective, that should not influence how you look at the person at all. And it's usually a negative that if this person's being honored by the goyim, he's probably bad. And the, you know, like, there's definitely a precedence in historical texts. And, uh, you know, that's why you say like a conflict, like Adam Green, um, is Judaism meant to be at conflict with the Goyim? Is that the way the religion is supposed to function? And then, uh, uh, you know, so modern orthodoxy that is, uh, you know, presenting it because the people are concerned about how the Goyim look at us. And, and uh, so from a theological issue, if you're in a Haredi community, there has to be a whole, uh, you know, fast, hard distinction between a Jew and a non-Jew. And let's say like just the fact that he's clean shaven. You know, then like in Hasidic culture, um, you're already a bum if you're clean shaven. And because you know, like that that's already a goyish thing to do. So if you're saying that's extremism, that's uh something beyond Judaism, and then uh you're gonna base that on Judaic studies. So from a the orthodox is the buzzword because you know Kugel's orthodox also, but the Karadi perspective, this guy's a bad influence. This guy's bad for Judaism. Modern orthodox perspective might uh, be the opposite, and it's going to come down to what's good for Judaism, and then you know what does the book say? What does the religion teach? So if you take a hardcore position, I just mentioned like money is important, and just teaching people to uh, um, you know beware. You know, saying honor among the goyim is less valuable than money. So I say, yeah, no, if he was a billionaire um, versus being well-liked among the goyim, there's precedence in historical Judaism that having money is much more important than uh, you know having this so-called respect among the goyim. And especially when this guy's held up as a Jewish scholar and he's not living the way that the rabbis recommend, it becomes problematic in almost all Judaic uh, studies. Like I can't think of one Judaic study professor I ever met or heard of that would be held up as a role model to someone you're trying to train their kids to uh, to be orthodox. So uh, you know, what do you make of this person? So I mean, Luke, you could say, I like this person because I think my dad would have respected him. But saying that, well, that's not your Judaism thinking. That's you thinking what your dad would have respected. Well, well, there are a lot of people like me who value those who pursue the truth. So for those who pursue the truth. We value other people who pursue the truth, even when it comes at a cost. But for other people, they don't care about the truth. So for morons who don't care about the truth, then they're not going to respect people who care about the truth. But for those for whom the pursuit of truth is a passionate, intense preoccupation, then we are going to recognize other people who have a passionate, intense preoccupation with pursuing truth. I, I recognize that most people don't care very much about the truth. You know, I say the opposite. I'm saying the Haredim are the ones who pursue the truth because, I mean, are, are willing to live the truth. He's okay, Kugel, he just wants to understand the truth. He doesn't want to live the truth. But you're saying, like, no, it's the Haredim who live the truth. And, and just saying, like, no, I'm sorry. I reject the secular world because I want the truth. I don't care about COVID from the Goyim because I want the truth. And, uh, you know, that perspective is like, oh, this scholar who read a bunch of books and wrote a bunch of papers, but his lifestyle is not endemic of the truth of Judaism and, and saying this man lives the truth because he accepted that Judaism is a false religion. He's so honorable because he looked in the mirror and saw, unfortunately, we're part of a false religion and admitted it. So, I mean, it sounds like that's what you're, you know, he's an honorable man for admitting that our religion is false as opposed to a person. I'm an honorable man because I'm willing to suffer anti-Semitism. I'm willing to suffer 
being dejected by society. I'm willing to, you know, even God forbid, Holocaust and pogroms because I believe in the truth. I do not fear death. I do not fear anti-Semitism. I don't fear any of this stuff. And when you look at this man, it's like the old, already the Middle Ages, where you say the simple person who was a moron and really believed when it came time to bow or convert, um, it convert or die, they chose death. And the philosophers who thought about the truth, they all converted. So you're looking at Kugel like that and saying like, well, I'm not saying that every guy in Burl Park would choose death over conversion. And you're saying, you're saying that's even a moronic standard to hold it to. But, uh, you know, if you're saying the ultimate truth, uh, why isn't uh, following Judaism to such a T that you don't even care if people kill or hate you a bigger sign of a person really trying to live for truth? They really believe in God because I don't even care what anybody else thinks. I'm only concerned about what God thinks. Yeah, well, that's not a pursuit of truth. That's just doing what they were told. So that, that's no, I'm saying it's a pursuit following. of truth because that's what the books say. Oh, I'm oh, going to do what. Wh where are they pursuing the truth? Like they're not doing any scholarship. Well, I'm saying, what does scholarship mean? What does scholarship mean? It means independent investigation of uh, facts that haven't previously been brought to light. Yeah, I mean, so if it's Sanhedrin, you know, Chalik chapter eleven, all you know, call call Israel Yeshlem, Chalik Loylem Haba, all Israel has a portion in the world to uh, come, except for uh, the people who don't believe in Messiah and the resurrection of the dead and the happy Corso. So, I mean, it okay, says there's very no scholarship it, there. You're just repeating something that was written 2,000 years ago. You think that well, there's commentary be repeating, saying, repeating other people's commentary and other people's words, that's not scholarship. That's just, well, you know, scholarship any moron say, can do that. What you're saying that, do you believe the Mishnah or not? And if you look at the Mishnah, is it reasonable to say that uh, Professor Kugel has no share in the world to come? Like, how do you interpret the Mishnah any other way than Professor Kugel has no share in the world to come? Well, there have been do dozens of rabbis who've done commentaries on this very text, so you'd have to know them. But the people who speak the way that you're talking, they don't know anything. They don't know the commentaries. They're just a bunch of morons who mindlessly repeat, you know, hateful, moronic things. Well, I mean, not maybe you're saying that like, this is your religion, Luke. I mean, I'm saying like that this is what you are. Professor Kugel is a figurehead at Harvard that doesn't actually represent what you are. The people who you just called morons are representative of what you actually are. Most people are moronic. Most people aren't very smart. Most people don't do very much study. Most people just try to meet their basic needs. I, I don't venerate that. I venerate people who, who are great, who, who do you know, solid, you know, innovative things. I, I don't venerate people who simply go along with the crowd and simply mindlessly repeat the, the prejudices of the people that they're around. Well, I mean, okay, the people have prejudices and people are, you know, and people are people, Kareem are people, hatred isn't a positive Jewish value. Uh, but I saying from a, in, in, a, in Jerusalem, in a fully orthodox society where everybody follows the law, there's a big difference about what is, uh, you know, the covered begoyim, versus uh, covered from the Jews. What does it mean to be honor in the type of the way that Goyim honor us and the way Jews honor us? And uh, to say, I pursue the truth because the texts tell me that honor from the Goyim is completely, utterly meaningless. Zero, zilch, nothing. And okay, so, great. So when they need a doctor, they don't care about doctors who are honored by the Goyim. They're happy to have, you know, some doctor just practices Talmudic medicine. When a Haredi Jew gets sick, they don't care about getting a doctor who has been honored by prestigious non-Jewish organizations or has gone to elite medical schools. They just want someone to practice Talmudic medicine. Who cares about some doctor who's honored by the Goyim? That's nonsense. Haredi Jews want the very best doctors available. They don't want doctors who practice Talmudic medicine. They want doctors who went to Harvard. They want the doctors at the very peak of their profession who are widely honored by the Goyim. They don't want some schlepper who reads Sanhedrin and tries to treat their disease based on these Talmudic texts. So in many, many areas of life, Haredi Jews value Jews who are honored by the Goyim. Any Jew who's rich is, is likely to have uh, received some honor among the Goyim. You talk about how Haredi Jews venerate Jews who are rich. Well, all those Jews they're venerating, these are Jews who have a good name among very many Goyim. Jews who are very good doctors. Jews who can provide necessary legal services, dental services, accounting services. These are all Jews who in all likelihood are honored by the Goyim. So in plenty of their lives, Haredi Jews honor Jews who are honored by the Goyim. Well, I'm, I'm talking about 
it's not like a bad thing to be honored by the goyim. It's a good thing to be honest. It's a good thing to be respected by the goyim. But from a religious perspective, honor from the goyim uh, should be looked at as meaningless. So if you're looking at how do you know a good doctor, and it even says in the Talmud about uh, the Talmud says that uh, you shouldn't see a heretical doctor. It says uh, they, if they give you the cure, you shouldn't take the cure for them. You should you may listen to them and you maybe uh, double check and uh, various things. And you said you thought Kugel was more indicative of a person searching for truth than a person, um, you know, like a Haredi person. Maybe it depends. Like if you mean searching from truth as an intellectual endeavor, and that, that's why I say like in Perky Elvos, all of the Mishnahs, Hillel, Hoya Ho'oymer, all, you know, the Rabbi Kiva, all the Mishnahs started at Hoya Ho'oymer. He was as he said. So if you mean living the truth that you say okay maybe uh maybe i accept your point that uh, you know, this guy cool he's just smarter intellectually he has a better understanding of the truth but if you mean living the truth does he make an attempt to live the truth and you talk to the Haredi guy who says you know okay all these books that we're talking about the only ones that mean anything are those ones right there so if you can't quote from those books i'm going to put my um I mean, it's funny we played that video god forbid of uh those guys uh, um, busting into the mother about the get. And if you notice, like, I think they yeah. started going like, la, la, la. Like, yeah. I don't know if you remember that video, yeah, yeah, like yeah. they start going. Yeah. And so I remember uh, Haredim doing that. Like, I would mention like Aristotle or something. Cause like, like you know, I'm more like you than me. Cause like, even though, yeah, no, uh, you're, you're yeah I'm, I'm just doing the argument yeah, for, I appreciate you know, it. Yeah. Well, cause that's what Torah is about. Uh, but, but uh I had many times where people, you know, like la 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 la, did that to me when I started mentioning that stuff. And when I was in yeshiva, um, they threw out my books. I, you know, I had a, like a, f a few different times they confiscated and threw out my books. And and so you say these are backwards uh, people. But if you look at what does it mean to pursue truth, what does it mean to live truth? And if you say like, no, I mean, you 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 became a Jew. You accept that what's laid out in those books means a lot more than what's laid out in other books. So if you're pursuing and trying to live by the truth, um, you have to give a lot more weight to uh, you know, the Talmud and the Torah than uh, than to scholarship. And that's what it means to pursue and live truth. Yeah, good, good points there. I'll read a little bit more from this Moment Magazine article. Uh, scholarly consensus on James Kugel's 2007 book, How to Read the Bible, has been less forgiving especially on the chapters that focus on James Kugel's approach to reconciling Orthodox Judaism and biblical scholarship. A professor at the Jewish Theological Seminary wrote in the Jewish Quarterly Review, James Kugel has written a stunning number of spectacular books and how to read the Bible is not one of them. So this professor equates Kugel's view on the irreconcilability of traditional Judaism and biblical scholarship to sticking one's head in the sand. A Jew whose intellect believes that biblical criticism makes valid claims but whose religious self pretends otherwise, is rendering God's service that is fragmented and defective. Any thoughts on that, David? Well, I mean, I think is it's difficult to, uh, you know, the like church of entropy, you have to have the axioms. So if the axiom in conflict is that the Torah is true, that there is a God, and God basically decides things on how well we follow what's in these uh, religious texts and books uh, versus alternative axiom. So if the axiom is that uh, science and logic should dictate what a person does, um, and I, I don't know how a Juda I mean, a Judaic studies professor can't really legitimate their axioms, and, and I think Kugel's even saying it himself, like that, I mean, he might be in a joking way, uh, but 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 uh, you know, what what truth does he stand on? His truth is that he rejected the truth that the Kratom say that is true. But what truth did he come up with? Like what 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 did he discover? What what did uh, what, what what did you learn from Professor Kugel that's useful and benefits your Judaism besides for how to make fun of Kratom? He doesn't say anything to my knowledge about making fun of Haredim. He simply summarizes the latest in biblical research and compares and contrasts it with traditional approaches, traditional Jewish approaches to the text. 
will that benefit your faith or, or hurt your faith? Well, it, it depends. Like if you're on a low level, it's going to hurt your faith because you're not able to deal with with two contradictory and seemingly irreconcilable perspectives. But if you're a little bit more intelligent, you understand there that are our own fallibility, our own limitations, and so you're much much more at ease with living with what you call the multiple truth hypothesis hypothesis that there are often multiple truths, and even though we can't reconcile them. Uh, we can make peace with our own fallibility, with our own limitations. Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I appreciate many, multiple truth hypotheses and saying that generally that's what I need for myself. If you're an Orthodox Jew, do you don't need the multiple truth hypothesis. There's only one truth, and that's the one that we follow. So I need the multiple truth hypothesis because uh, I need some vindication for there to be other things that are true uh, independently of Judaism. Um, but if you take that perspective where you're agreeing with me that something could be true independently of Judaism. And someone said that's heresy. Uh, Judaism is the only thing that is independently true and anything uh, truth value could only be determined by its relationship to the truth of Judaism. And the Kugel is using these outside standards such as like logic and the scientific method to determine truth and, uh, and even to question the truths that are generally accepted uh, historically from our religion as being, uh, you know, axiomatically true. Okay, great. I'm uh, going to move on soon. Do you have any final thoughts for today? Yeah, I appreciate it. Like, I, I've thought about these things, and I like the scholarship. Um, and, and that's why I think the multiple truth hypothesis is actually important. And saying, like, Haredim, they're, they're really not so dumb or backwards. There's a, there's a general logic based on their axioms that uh, uh, that might cause conflict and might uh, you know might, might make sense to you know measure people by how much money they have or to discredit uh, um, secular things and independently in their system that makes sense versus a person who 